So uh, organ preservation therapy uh, involving surgery, radiation, and often chemotherapy is actually incredibly common across multiple uh, disciplines. You know, lumpectomy and radiation uh, is now the standard of care for the vast majority of early stage breast cancers. Uh, chemo radiation uh, instead of total layer injectomy is the standard of care for most uh, larynx cancers. Uh, and extremity sarcoma, uh, uh, amputation has been replaced for many of these patients uh, with a surgical intervention, uh, but a more limited surgery followed by radiation. And so bladder preservation uh, fits within this context of a multimodality treatment uh, involving uh, surgery and radiation and chemotherapy. So this is a quick uh, overview, I think, of where we are now uh, from a recent review in terms of uh, bladder preservation. This is a little bit of a Great Britain bias to this uh, because, frankly, uh, they've been much more active at a national level than we have, so they've published more on it lately. So as many of you know, you know the best candidates for uh, bladder preservation are, are uh, T2 muscle invasive bladder cancer, preferably no negative and non-metastatic, uh, good performance status to tolerate chemotherapy, no bladder, no previous pelvic radiotherapy, and importantly, good bladder function, because if we're trying to preserve the bladder, we're trying to preserve the bladder to preserve function, and then obviously adequate function to get chemotherapy. Uh, TURBT is the uh, first and very important part of this, uh, and we'll talk about the utility of that. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy is done sometimes, although the benefit of that is a little less clear. Uh, then a combination of radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And the North American standard of this had often been twice daily radiation uh, to the pelvic lymph nodes and the bladder, uh, along with platinum-based chemotherapy. Uh, Great Britain has taken a slightly different bent on that, uh, and they tend to use larger fractions of radiation once a day, uh, and then there's a, a number of different chemotherapy regimens uh, that are available, 5-FU uh, and mitomycin being one regimen uh, that is uh, very useful because it's eligible for those that can't tolerate cisplatin. Uh, and then follow-up is extraordinarily important as well, uh, which is you know, critical to all of you here in this room. Uh, cystoscopies uh, quarterly for two years, and then six months uh, from, from that point uh, afterwards, and then annually, uh, along with um, CT staging. Uh, and cystectomy for uh, persistent local invasive recurrences, uh, and not necessarily for non-invasive recurrences. Uh, with the, you know, the caveats that my colleagues talked about earlier. So one of the long-term experiences in the United States is from MGH, because they've been doing this for a long time with Bill Shipley and now uh, Jason Estafiu. Uh, this was published several years ago, uh, about 350 patients treated from 86 to 2002. Uh, median follow-up is almost eight years. Uh, there's an example of what their radiation treatment fields look like uh, for the bladder with the rectum there on the side. So the disease-specific survival uh, at five years was 65%, uh, and at 10 years was 59%, and at 15 years was actually uh, above 50% as well. Uh, importantly, a, a little over half of these were T2, a little less than half greater than T2, uh, visibly complete TURBT in two-thirds, uh, and hydronephrosis in a minority of those patients. Uh, importantly, 80% of those alive at, at five years still have a native intact bladder. So we'll talk about uh, CR rate is important uh, for these patients. Uh, there were a whole series of trials done at MGH and RTOG uh, where they use CR rate as an important endpoint. So this is the CR uh, for patients who get TRBT, radiation, chemotherapy, and then are evaluated by cystoscopy at that point uh, with random bladder biopsy as well, looking for CR rate, uh, typically on the range of 70% or even a little higher in the more recent regimens. A cystectomy was done in this cohort in total in about 30%. Uh, that's about 17% of them immediately uh, because they had a poor initial response on that post-evaluation cystoscopy, uh, but then 12% in salvage cystectomy over time. Uh, and overall survival is here, 50% at five years, 35% uh, at 10 years. So let's get into the details. Uh, what is the role of each portion of this treatment, the surgery, the chemotherapy, the radiation? Uh, what's the quality of life one can anticipate after that? Uh, and along with Dr. Yen talking about what about newer agents, in particular checkpoint inhibitors? Uh, 
So is the complete TURBT uh, necessary? You know, it's not uncommon for, the, for me to get a patient referred uh, who, you know, is not going to have a cystectomy and the urologist wants to know, do I really need to go back in there? I was already there. You know, I think I got most of it out. And, and the answer to that really is, yes, the TURBT is very, very important. Now, I realize we're not randomizing patients to be able to get a complete TURBT. So obviously some of these patients you know, are able to get a TURBT because they have a tumor, tumor that's conducive to it. But uh, within that context, if you look at the patients that had a complete TURT versus those that don't, uh, complete response at the end of treatment is much greater, 80% uh, versus 60%. Overall survival at five years is greater, uh, almost 60% compared to 40%. Disease-specific survival is greater, and the need to have a cystectomy is greater. So uh, getting the complete TURBT having the urologist go back in and review again and do the best they can to remove the tumor is important. Uh, when we have patients that come from outside, for instance, that aren't good cystectomy candidates and are coming for treatment, we will re have an internal referral and have one of our urologists see the patients uh, to reevaluate and repeat the TRBT if necessary. So how about delayed cystectomy? Uh, there's often concern that delayed cystectomy is gonna lead to a much worse outcome. Uh, so these are the patients that get cystectomy. Uh, now realize the patients that get cystectomy have already self-selected biologically that they're a worse group of patients uh, because they didn't achieve a CR. Uh, but what you can see here is if you look at uh, disease-specific survival as a function of delayed cystectomy in red uh, versus immediate cystectomy in blue, uh, delayed cystectomy isn't worse. These patients are, are potentially not uh, struggling because of this. Uh, numerically slightly better uh, because, again, the immediate cystectomy patients are likely the worst actors. They're the ones that didn't respond to chemotherapy and radiation up front. So really, the key point here is surgical management is critical. The TURBT up front, uh, the evaluation post-chemotherapy uh, and radiation with cystectomy in 15 to 20 percent of patients at that time, uh, routine and regular surveillance cystoscopies, uh, and then salvage sur surgery in 10 to 15 percent of patients down the road. So I think it really, is, in some ways, is a misnomer to call this non-operative management because the urologists really play a key role in this. Uh, it's a non-cystectomy management, but it's, it really is not, not non-operative. So then what's the role of the chemotherapy? Uh, there have been at least two randomized trials that looked at radiation therapy and bladder cancer adding chemotherapy. One is this old NCIC study. Patients got induction radiation therapy with or without cisplatin, and then afterwards either completed a course of radiation or some of the patients did have a cystectomy. And what you can see, if you look at pelvic control long-term, those that got cisplatin had a much better chance of long-term pelvic control than those that got radiation therapy alone. And then more recently in the UK, uh, there was this large randomized trial uh, of patients with radiation therapy uh, plus or minus 5-FU and mitomycin. Uh, this was 5-FU uh, uh, during the course of radiation and a single dose of mitomycin. And again, pelvic control significantly better uh, in those that got chemotherapy. So there has often been the question, is really radiation needed? You know, we have all these chemotherapy regimens. We, uh, uh, pembrolizumab and all these other drugs, we can get to a, a path, a good CR. Do we need to do the radiation? Uh, so there was a study from, uh, from California, looked at 104 patients that got neoadjuvant MVAC followed by TURBT, uh, and for instance, the CR rate at evaluation in those patients was only about 50% uh, as compared to 70% typically in the trimodality therapies where you've added the radiation uh, with otherwise a very similar regimen. And then the salvage cystectomy rate in that group of patients was 66%. And again, compared to a total cystectomy rate on the order of 25 to 30% in patients given trimodality therapy. So it appears that radiation therapy improves the initial response to treatment and allows a greater chance to have the bladder remain intact. SWOG did run a trial evaluating this as well. Patients got neoadjuvant chemotherapy with gem paclitaxel carboplatin for three cycles, TUR, B2, E, uh, and then if they had residual disease, they would go to immediate cystectomy, uh, but if they had a clinical uh, complete response, uh, they had the observation of observation versus immediate cystectomy. Uh, there were about 77 patients here. Uh, the majority of them were T2. Uh, 
Uh, and the conclusion of the study was that although neoadjuvant paclitaxel carboplatin and gemcitabine had a promising uh, complete clinical response rate of 46%, the study failed to meet its primary objective as there was an unacceptably high 60% rate of persistent cancer at the cystectomy specimen in those that were presumed to be pathologic T0 after evaluation. And so in the cooperative group prospective fashion, this also did not appear to be successful. So how should the radiation be delivered? Um, again, many of you are probably familiar with the North American standard, which I think um, had very good and rational reasons for it to be in done uh, that Bill Shipley started in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, again, that typically involved twice daily radiation therapy, uh, initially starting to a pelvic field, then a narrow down to the bladder, uh, and then finally a narrow down to boost just the primary tumor. Um, you know, he was trying to, uh, you know, provide a comprehensive treatment. He was trying to uh, engage with the urologists who uh, were supportive of this treatment modality. Uh, but especially for patients in the community, it's a very difficult treatment to try to get patients to come in twice daily uh, for a period of five weeks. Uh, the, the Shipley MGH analysis also had a split course of radiation uh, with a cystoscopy in the middle of treatment uh, with the goal to try to get patients to cystectomy earlier if they had residual disease. And it's, I think, part of the reason why this regimen may not have been adapted more long term. Uh, in Great Britain, they were much more likely to use once daily radiation. Uh, they had two randomized trials, one looking at a hypoxia uh, sensitizer and one looking at the chemotherapy that we looked at previously. Uh, and those trials didn't randomize radiation dose, but allowed selection of the two most common regimens that were used in Great Britain at the time. Uh, the, the standard regimen, much closer to use in the United States, involved 64 gray in two gray fractions, uh, so a total of 32 treatments, a little over six weeks. Uh, and a regimen that was much more common in Great Britain, uh, 55 gray in 20 fractions of 2.75. Uh, again, this wasn't randomized, but they recently published a meta-analysis uh, of the combination of these treatments. And what you see here is uh, on the left of Unity here, uh, the local regional control appears to favor uh, the 55 gray regimen in 20 fractions in terms of muscle invasive recurrence with about a 30% reduction in the risk of muscle invasive recurrence in those that were selected to get the 20 fraction regimen. And also importantly, toxicity was not worse. Uh, the red line here uh, would be the line of non-inferiority. So the 55 gray regimen appeared to be non-inferior and potentially even superior for local control uh, and was non-inferior in terms of toxicity. So in Great Britain now, they're strongly advocating this as a treatment regimen. And I will say I started using this also uh, you know, five or six years ago and have found it very, very tolerable and very convenient for our patients. So the question also comes up, should we treat the whole bladder or should we treat the bladder and the pelvic lymph nodes? Uh, this is a randomized trial uh, for T2 to T4 bladder cancer that was done in Pakistan. Uh, patients also got weekly cisplatin, 40 milligrams per meter squared. Uh, they were randomized uh, to a total dose of 64 gray uh, with the one group getting a small pelvic field uh, with a boost to the bladder. Uh, and the other group getting just whole bladder radiation therapy. And what you can see is there was no difference in uh, bladder preservation, there was no difference in overall survival, uh, and local regional control down here, there was no difference in that either. So uh, this is a, actually a pretty reasonable sized trial, particularly for bladder radiation trials at 250 patients. So again, uh, many of the current radiation trials and including the one that I'll talk about in a minute, allows a bladder-only uh, course of radiation, if so chose, uh, but also allows uh, the pelvis plus bladder as an option. So what about patient-reported quality of life? There are a number of studies that have looked at this, uh, MGH in France, for instance, uh, but this again is off that randomized trial from Great Britain. Uh, they use the fact P bladder questionnaire, uh, what they found was the vast majority of patients had a decline in their bladder quality of life uh, in the first six months, uh, but then uh, during treatment, uh, with the majority of them recovering by six months, and two-thirds of the patients long-term reporting stable or improved quality of life. And so, for instance, these are just a few of the questions. I have trouble controlling my urine, uh, where the 
Uh, white bars here are those that have no trouble controlling their urine. Uh, that goes down uh, at the end of treatment uh, and then goes up. And you know, the rates here are really very comparable to what they were at the beginning uh, with sort of some uh, slight increases of more modest changes. Uh, similarly, I have trouble controlling my, my bowels. Uh, not at all uh, is the dark bars. Those things get a little bit worse and then get better with perhaps a little bit of residual bowel toxicity overall, but largely very similar. Uh, and I'm able to have, an, may have and maintain an erection. Again, dark bars uh, uh, is the sort of important group, and those persist, and sexual function appears largely preserved over time here to five years in patients on this bladder preservation protocol. Uh, in addition, within this analysis, it did not look like the addition of chemotherapy affected long-term quality of life in these patients, uh, which was one of the main reasons they did the analysis. So uh, in line with what Ed just talked about, uh, the radiation therapy, we are interested uh, in this NRG slash SWOG trial uh, of uh, concurrent chemoradiation therapy, adding a tizolimumab or tocentric for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Uh, this trial has opened and is accruing patients. Uh, here is the schematic for this. Uh, again, clinical T2 to T4 uh, without nodal metastases, it, or distant metastases. Uh, they are stratified by chemotherapy regimen by radiation field. Again, there's a selection here. Uh, interestingly, this trial actually allows sort of three options. Uh, there's a pelvic lymph node option and, and then ra radiation to the bladder. Uh, there's a bladder option, just whole bladder, uh, and there's a boost option, or there's even just a just tumor option, which I'm not particularly uh, familiar with, also uh, stratified by form and status and clinical stage. Uh, patients get concurrent chemoradiation therapy, uh, and then uh, options for chemo chemotherapy here are, again, a cisplatinum-based regimen, or they actually allow the regimen from Great Britain of 5-FU and mitomycin, uh, and then the ke chemotherapy regimen uh, with nine cycles of atizolimumab. Uh, the primary endpoint here is bladder intact event-free survival over time uh, with appropriate secondary endpoints. Uh, and then there are some translational endpoints. MRE11 in particular appears to uh, in some previous publications to be suggestive of, of identifying a cohort of patients that may benefit from platinum-based bladder preservation. So I would say in conclusion overall, trimobality bladder preservation represents a viable but unfortunately underutilized option for T2 to T4 bladder cancer in the United States. It really re does require co coordinated multidisciplinary care between urology, medical oncology, and radiation oncology. Each component of this treatment is critical. Each member of the team is critical. Uh, I do believe it provides excellent quality of life for patients long term. Uh, and we're excited and hope that newer agents may provide improved outcomes.